Welcome to the Daughters Project Podcast. We're so glad you're here. Join us this season as the sisters, along with Father Harrison Eyre, explore what it means to live with a sacramental worldview. You can find out more about our work at thedaughtersproject.com and on social media at Daughter St. Paul. Enjoy today's episode. Welcome to the Daughters Project podcast. My name is Sister Danielle Victoria, and I am here with Sister Nancy Elselman and Father Harrison Eyre, the father daughter. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the club, Padre. It's good to have you join the team. Um, I'm really excited to be joining you guys for this uh, this series, this episode of the Daughters Project podcast, where we're featuring your book, Father Harrison Mysterion. I've just really enjoyed reading the book, and I've also had the privilege of being able to design for the book. So I've really spent a lot of time praying with the themes visually and and written. So. Um, I'm just super excited. I know in the tradition of the podcast, we start off with a story, and I'm I'm so excited too that we're having the edition of Overheard in the Parish. And <laughs> Sister Nancy, you have uh, a story to get us started today. Let's hear yes. it. Yes, yeah. So uh, th- today's theme is going to be uh, focused on incarnation, and sometimes we don't realize how we come across to people or what they receive from our presence, and. I worked in our Pauline Book and Media Center, and this was right before I was making my final vows. And I was going through a little struggle time, you know, trying to discern, is this really what God wants of me? I mean, after 10 years of formation, is this really where I'm supposed to be in my life? And so I went to work in our Pauline Book and Media Center in Midtown Manhattan. And really that place is so wonderful because it's like a microcosm of the world. People walk in from all over the world, but from all stratospheres of life. I mean, from the the homeless on the streets to to, uh, people walking and working on Park Avenue. Well, I was working there one time and I was just walking around one of the shelves and fixing it up and, you know, asking people if they needed help when they came in. And this one woman comes over right to me. And like I told you, I always think I was struggling a little bit to think about where I'm meant to be in life. And she comes right over to me, like, like direct line right to me, walks in the door, comes right to me. And she says, looks me in the face and says, you're in love. (laughs) And I'm like, oh, okay. (laughs) How many people come and do that to you (laughs) out of the blue? I don't know. But she goes, you're in love. And I'm thinking, well, uh, yes, I'm in love with the Lord and I'm in, I'm in the process of really discerning to make my final vows. And she just said to me, we'll do it because I can see it. I could see you're in love with him. So do it. <laughs> and I was, okay. Was that God's sign or what? Like I oh, wow. need to be aware. And like, she was God's presence for me. She was Christ to me at that moment, especially when I needed it the most in, in my discernment. And yeah. it was just one of many signs that came along the way in my discernment. But I, I thought that was kind of unusual and, um, and, and kind of unexpected, as most, as most signs that come to us are unexpected. Yeah, it's so incredible. I had a spiritual director once who said, God shows up to us sometimes as our life you know, and like the stuff that you're really living in. And I love that about our topic of participation in Christ. The sacramental worldview is really about like diving in and delving into seeing Christ in everything and every aspect of our lives. One thing is like that I feel like that gets expressed a lot in our life is humor. And one of our sisters was telling me a story. She is out. um, We have this Um, house that we're able to uh, spend some time at for vacation and it's by the water and it's really windy out there and she was out there and she was like telling the story how her veil was just like blowing in the wind and she was like oh my goodness it's like a wind sock (laughs) I just like I love that because immediately everybody knew exactly what she meant. Like this very unique experience. Like, just this introduction of humor. And that that was like part, like a really significant moment of like relaxation for her and her vacation. So, and it was hilarious. So God shows up in like 
hilarious ways and in, in beautiful ways like that. Cause, um, mm -hmm. like you knew that that was for you. you know? Well, I couldn't help it. She comes right to my face. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's good at that. She was crazy. Yeah. But... <laughs> I mean, kind of like no sense of like interpersonal space, you know, like come right, come right up to me. Like, okay, Lord. She was a close talker. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I can't help but think of like, I think that was a Seinfeld episode at one point or something. I think that was yes. like a cool episode. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Close talker. <laughs> Father Harrison, I got to ask you this question. Yeah. It's just bugging me. Yeah. Are you secretly Pauline? <laughs> seriously so, seriously uh, this chapter this, I'm, i i mean i i talk yeah, about participation in christ man yeah mm -hmm. this is something that's been <laughs> kind of been it's on my heart a lot because uh we, again i think we talked about this briefly on one of the other episodes but like when i wrote my proposal like my little kind of sample sister Teresa, like her first comment was this is so pauline Right. And it was just cool to hear because like, you know, I also, just, you know, I feel like I do share in the Pauline charism too around media as well. Right. So it, it was just one of those moments. And I'm like, and she was just like, you have no idea how Pauline all this is. <laughs> and she goes like your book really fits with our charism. And it really kind of expresses our charism with this idea that everything we do is in Christ. And it's funny because like, because like that's actually one of the Paul, St. Paul's like central teachings. Right. Mm -hmm. Paul. It, it, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Right. <laughs> and so through that, I, it was actually like way back when I was in seminary. I, remember, I think it was in like my, I, I want to say it was in my um, Pauline scripture class when we had to do like Pauline literature. And I decided to do an exegesis on Romans six mm -hmm. about baptism. Right. And I started looking at how Paul uses the word in it just sounds like a very boring thing to do, but it's, it, it was like, it was just eye opening because I now under, when he uses the phrase in Christ, I just understand it in a totally different way now than I think we so easily and passively hear the phrase. And so it kind of changed how I viewed everything in, in some ways by understanding Romans six. And then in more in general with Paul talks about this. And I, I tried to find the quote and I couldn't find it, but I, I've heard it said often enough that, that. C.S. Lewis says that if we only understood what St. Paul meant by the word in, we would die of ecstasy. Mm. Mm. Wow. Right? And so mm -hmm. it, it's, yeah, so it's been a journey. And then uh, uh, Sister Carly sent me a bunch of Pauline material uh, <laughs> and the Pauline, the Pauline prayer book, the Pauline prayer book. And I, and then Sister Helena, I think it was, was it Sister Helena or Sister Carly? Or maybe both were sending me a bunch of the PDFs of, Blessed Alberioni's oh, yeah. books and stuff like that mm -hmm. that are in English and reading him, I'm like, okay, yeah, we've got a kindred soul here. So, yes. yeah, so it's, been, it's actually been on my heart to contemplate um, the third order for priests. So oh, I'm awesome. still praying about that. I got to get a few more ducks of, in my own <laughs> life in order first before I start taking that seriously. But it was this book project definitely put that on my heart a lot more. Well, this Pauline goal that you really reiterate uh, in this, which is basically Paul to live in Christ, as Paul mm -hmm. says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me in Galatians. Uh, but you also said it's, it's taking in the whole person, our mind, our will, our heart, mind, body, soul, intellect, everything, our whole person is conformed to Christ. Now mm -hmm. that word, those words conform to Christ yeah. is so Alberione, okay? Our, <laughs> Paul, our founder, Blessed James Alberione, talks about conformation in Christ to be formed, conformed to Christ. And he calls it Christification. Mm -hmm. And um, and he has this wonderful quote. It says, the process of sanctification is a process of Christification until Christ be formed in you. And we'll be saints in the measure in which Christ lives in us. And, uh, or better, in the measure in which Christ, it, in which we live the life of Christ, but more so that Christ lives in us. That's everything about what he says in our Paul, Pauline spirituality mm. and charism. And I, and I think you just like, <laughs> you got it in a nutshell. It's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. That's so cool to hear. It's like, yeah, when you, when you, when you read saints and you realize like they're saying the same thing as you, you realize you're probably on the right path. You're yeah. like, good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's so beautiful that you came to that um, from an experiential level that you kind of came to that uh to the in the in Christ from from outside of even the the theology, you know, like that it's 
I don't know. It's just like, it's really beautiful. Like to see that you, you kind of came that in your own to that conclusion in your own journey. Yeah. yeah. And it's, a, it's a work of the Holy spirit, right? Like that's, that's yeah. always the confirmations that these are works of the Holy spirit in the end and not our own that he does this. And then like, yeah, he, he sets up your own experiences. And like it, 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 for me too, it's like, cause yeah, that was like a more intellectual thing, like through studies and stuff, but it's just, it's experience too, right? Like this is the Christian way that every, like, you start to talk about it. You almost like your brain wants to explode with <laughs> the reality of the fact that in, even in this moment right now, Christ is in us and we are in him and that he is working in the world in us right now. Like, mm -hmm. you know, Amen it's just that. Like... <laughs> <laughs> that changes everything. The, it is everything. the incarnational moment that we become aware of. Yay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, that, but that, isn't that awesome that, that that's what Christ does. He, he, by taking on our humanity, he really and truly enters into all humanity right he mm -hmm. tr he transformed by taking by entering into human nature he has god has now transformed it by entering into it fully so that in our humanity through baptism christ is really at work there it's like and so like i think i say it in a later chapter about baptism but like this is what baptism is all about it's not a once in a lifetime event it's mm -hmm. a it's it's christ all it's the gate it's the gateway to christ always being at, at work in us right it, it's it's the landing pad if you will for mm -hmm. christ to come into our hearts and into our life in a real way not in a poetic sense like oh yeah the spirit of jesus lives no no, no. he literally mm -hmm. really truly substantially lives in you through the baptism <laughs> exactly yeah exactly well like in this moment of like we're in the easter season i was praying with the antiphon for today and it talks about like Christ having risen from the dead dies no more. Death will no longer have dominion over him. Alleluia. And just, um, we're coming out of Lent and we've been really, um, we've been working on a book on for Advent, actually, even during that time with sister Alethea contemplating, contemplating memento mori. Right. And like really praying with the hope that like, because of the incarnation, because Christ um, came and died and rose from the dead in the resurrection, like we no longer have to be subject to death. Like we are like the hope that sits in that. And that when we really look at that in relationship to all the things of our life, um, it's so, it's so profound, like in, in the sense of like, having a sacramental worldview makes all the difference in that, in that reality. Like it, it's hopeless. It's dark. It's metal in the worst way <laughs> without that reality. And um, one of the things that I've been contemplating with that is like how um, that's really serving people's needs um, to be able to contemplate death in light of the resurrection and just how that's helping people deal with this moment that we're in during COVID, you know, that like, because when you sit, when you're able to sit amidst the suffering and the longing and the thirst that you spoke about in previous um, episodes, it's like, how do you sit there? How? I mean, they're going to happen and it happens in duration and over time. And how as, a, um, as anyone, but as even in in choosing to follow Christ and desiring to be a Christian, how do you live that? And this word in, I guess I'm kind of like suddenly to even find my way into like talking about how it radically changes how you live amidst the struggle of our human experience. And, um, and that's really the power and the grace and the gift of the sacramental worldview. It's like you really enter into the resurrection of the most difficult of circumstances. There's a really great film that came out last year and it didn't get a lot of notice. It was on Disney and it's a teen story um, about a young musician, Zach Sobiek. And it's actually a true story. Uh, is a young man who was discovers he has cancer and realize he has only a few months to live. And he, he realizes his dream of writing music. And so he writes, really, it's a one hit wonder. He writes a song and it gets noticed and it's recorded and it gets on the radio. And it's, it's an amazing story, first of all, because the family's Catholic and they actually have a little trip to Lourdes. Um, I don't know if I talked about this the last time, but it was such a great story because he shows uh, everybody around him, his family, his friends, 
and all of us who are viewing this story, how to live by how to die. And you talked about, you know, memento mori in the sense of like, yes, we're, we're celebrating Christ's resurrection, but also in the awareness of death that, you know, this life is not all that, that there is, but there is something more that's waiting for us. And, um, it's such a great story. And I, I'm, I'm sad it didn't get a lot of notice. So any listeners out there, go look for the movie clouds. It's so worth watching. <laughs> is it on Disney plus? It must I be think on Disney it's plus. on Disney yeah. plus. Yes. I'll have to check it out there. <laughs> Gotta get Disney plus. <laughs> it's a great story though. <laughs> I mean, in a way, the sacramental worldview, this idea of participation, right? This is this is another key phrase in all of this, and that we kind of explore in the book: the idea of participation, um, not like participation that like participation in its deepest sense. Again, like, and 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 there are a lot of barriers to this, which we're going to talk about in the next episode around modernism. But but um, we're we're really in Christ, and so, but it, it, which that's where hope lies, right? For, I've always liked to use this phrase that, like, and it's kind of like communion and liberation ish to say, because I, I have a tendency towards that spirituality too, as, you know, hope is the recognition of a presence, right? And it does it mean, like, hope, like, we always use hope as wishful thinking. Oh, you know, if I just do X, Y, and Z, I'm going to overcome this illness. That's not what hope is. No, hope is saying, Christ is here. Right. Like, you know, I can share for myself that, you know, especially in January and it, it's still been kind of lingering. It's been getting less and less. But, you know, COVID kind of hit me psychologically and personally uh, for for a bit there. I'm an extrovert. I need to be around people and <laughs> I'm not. And as a priest, my whole life is dedicated towards serving others. And there's not a lot of opportunities to do those things right now. And when that that rug gets pulled from you, it's not a lot of fun. And I'll be honest, even my prayer life in January was not as strong as it could be. But I had one little prayer I had on my lip every my lips every other day, every day. Jesus, help me to find you in this. I know you are here. And that's like for me, that's always been Christian hope. Right? In the suffering and the hardship. It's not saying Jesus take I never said Jesus take this away. I mean, I would like him to, but it was no no, help me to encounter you here. Because I know that you, because you've gone to the cross and into death, that that is because you are also God, that is now an eternal event. That is, I am, that you are now participating and lifting me up into. Mm -hmm. But I know it leads to redemption. And so I don't want to avoid this. I don't want to run away from this. I want to find you here. And, And because when you, because by saying that, it's, it's also saying, I know you are here. I just can't see it because of the idea of participation of being in him. He really did. He like, it, it, I, I know I keep on saying, because like, it's real. It is so, it is the realest thing ever mm. that we are in him and in the whole mystery of his life. And so when we're suffering, it's really about saying, yeah, Jesus, you're here. I really love one of the points that you bring out, especially about in Jesus Christ, eternity is made present to us through his humanity in this time and in this space, mm-hmm. like in, in time and space. So about time and an eternity. And, you know, we can look a lot to um, some of the saints who kind of embodied this. And right away when I was reading this, I, it came to my mind, um, the life of Padre Pio. And, you know, as a little kid, I remember my dad, I must have been like seven years old, my dad bringing me to this store um someone giving a talk about padre pio and the stigmata and how he had the physical wounds of christ you know in his own body and i I was so fascinated by that as a kid i was like wow wow what would it feel like to have jesus's wounds that's all i kept thinking about (laughs) as a little kid careful what you wish i was like well i don't think i'm holy enough because i was a little precocious (laughs) child you know i was always moving i was never sitting still and so i think i was like no i'm not holy enough to receive the stigmata but maybe that's okay i don't really want to suffer jesus that's that's not something i really want (laughs) but anyway i i love this story about padrefield he's great and it's an italian actor and comedian uh, who told his doctor that he was going to see Padre Pio. And the doctor replied that 
you know, Padre Pio got the stigmata because he thought too much about the wounds of Christ, so whatever. Well, this this actor and comedian saw Padre Pio the next day, and when Padre Pio saw him right away, he says, you know, when you see your doctor, tell him to think intensely about being an ox. Let's see if he grows any horns. I said, oh my gosh. <laughs> I love this kind of like, like very, you know, he's so real and, yeah. you know, gritty and yeah. human. He's yeah. so human. When, when we think mm -hmm. of Padre Pio, sometimes we can just kind of elevate him way beyond us. But in actual fact, he's very concrete, just like us. And just as Christ, he, eternity is made present in us his humanity well even in people like Padre Pio his humanity was revealing the beauty of his spirituality the gift mm -hmm. that he was giving of himself to God and I, I just you know I went to see San Giovanni Rotondo in in Italy oh my gosh a fabulous place where he's buried and where his where he lived the Franciscan monastery uh, what a prof beautiful place to um, just experience uh, his spirituality, and, and I just sensed it as soon as I walked in over there. Mm. It was amazing. I don't know if you, uh, either of you had a chance to go there. Yeah, I went just before World Youth Day in 2005. Wow. I was in Italy wow. for, for a month, so I, I, someone's like, oh, you have to go here. I was like, I didn't even, I was still Newark-ish Catholic, so I uh, still didn't, uh, I didn't quite know, like, what San Giovanni Rotondo was or who Padre Pio <laughs> even really was. I was like, you have to go here. And I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. Oh, like, oh, I heard Padre Pio. I'm like, oh, I didn't realize that. So it's good. And then I went to Monte San Angelo where St. Michael yes. the Archangel appeared. Oh, and wow. All that fun stuff. Wow. Yeah, in that area of Italy. Nice. That's so great. That's so great. Yeah, I've never been to I've never been to Italy. I went um to Lourdes and followed through Barcelona. So I was loving your guys' episode. Yes. <laughs> I had a really amazing experience myself in Sagrada Familia. Um, but I was on my way out of the church actually while I was going through there. And I That's stopped amazing. off at Lourdes because my grandmother, I remembered her like badgering <laughs> me with the rosary and telling me about Lourdes. And so I was like, I gotta stop there because I'm gonna pass it on my way to Bar Barcelona. Isn't Catholic guilt great? Yeah, it's the best. I, I seriously owe so much to my badgering Italian grandmother. <laughs> like, truly, truly. Oh, my goodness. I love what you're saying and, and what you've uh, written about in terms of like time and eternity, like how um, God enters into through Christ into time brings eternity, but also how he emptied himself, you know, um, in a sense of in in becoming uh, man. Mm -hmm. um, that poverty that he lives in, in solidarity with us. You write about that and, and how we can enter into, or have this, like the sacramental worldview offers like discovery, mm -hmm. like these epiphanies of something far beyond something transcendental, something far beyond ourselves. And mm -hmm. I'm curious for you, for either of you, like, um, you, you've spoken about experiences of, of beauty, but do you have moments like, and like with the liturgy or like where time and eternity where this kind of experience really came together or coalesced for you um and and had like a a moment of of that experience of of time and eternity coming together i for me it, it's very much rooted actually in my conversion um because i was baptized as a bit as an infant but never grew up going to church. My mom had polio when she was a child. So she's like one of the last, she's in record books as being some of the last, one of the last people getting polio. And so she, we, growing up, she had a lot of post-polio complications. And so she was quite sick. She's had like over 30 surgeries in her life. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so she had a lot of, so she was just too sick when we were growing up to go to church. I remember being put in catechism for a few weeks, but then we had to pull me out because she just, they just couldn't take me every week. And so we never really went to church growing up, right? And um, this is going to, I'll make it kind of a Cliff Notes version here, but I still remember it, for me, it was one night I was talking to, a, you know, I, I had gone through RCA to receive confirmation in First Communion when I was in university, but did it kind of because of a bunch of pressures. And I stopped going to church the day after. Uh, I didn't even do my first confession before uh, my confirmation, which is a big no-no. <laughs> but, uh, um, um, but it was January 8th, 2004. I still remember the day perfectly where um i was sitting at my computer talking to a friend on msn messenger and i said to them i have to go and i shut down my computer and i said to myself i have to pray well like how do you pray 
Hmm. And the only the inspiration that came over to me was to say Jesus's name slowly over and over again, right? Which is a short form of the Jesus prayer, like Lord Jesus Christ, and the God have mercy on me, a sinner. In the Eastern Christian tradition, just saying Jesus's name is kind of like the the quick form of that prayer. I discovered hmm. afterwards. Um, so I just said, I just closed my eyes and I just said Jesus, 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 and I just kind of threw myself into that prayer. And in that moment, it, it's always hard to describe because it was such an intimate encounter with divine love. And I lost track of time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it was one of those, it was one of those prayerful moments where I've honestly, I've never experienced anything like it since then, <laughs> where it was just mm-hmm. like, it was an intimate encounter with a divine love that says, I desire you and I want you. And, uh, you know, and I was just kind of thrown into that and, and, it, and I say this, not trying to make it sound like, because it's not like, it's always hard, it's really hard to put into words, but it's also not like something uber mystical, like what we might think in like, a, like oh, he had visions and, you know, he probably saw the inner life of the, like, no, none of that stuff. <laughs> right. None in of fact, that stuff. It sounds simple. Yeah, it sounds it's simple. very simple. It was very yeah. simple, right? Mm-hmm. And it's hard to put, but it's hard to work, put a word. There is something also radically different about God's love than human love mm-hmm. that is hard to put into words. And so I kind of came out of that and that was, but I was, it's funny because I was still not sure if that was like, was that just me or was that from God? And so the next inspiration was to pick up my Bible and read. Mm-hmm. And the first thing I read was, and I, so I picked up the Bible, blew off the dust because I'd never actually cracked it open. Um, <laughs> and I just randomly opened it and I ran and I opened it to first Samuel three, the call of Samuel. Oh, and so I was like, all right. God's doing something here. And I went back, I got to my first confession a few weeks later, which was amazing. And so that experience for me was a real participation in it where, where time and eternity melded together a little bit more experientially. Mm-hmm. I had uh, an experience too. Um, obviously I, I wasn't converted to the faith because I was always been since a baby, but, um, and my family has always been very religious in in many ways and, taking us to different places. But one of the most profound experiences I had was as a religious sister, and I've already made my final vows. And I requested that we go to a group of young sisters. We usually go to Italy uh, to our founding, because we were founded in Italy. Albert, Father Alberiani founded us in Northern Italy. And all the sisters got a chance to make a pilgrimage, to go to Italy, to make the pilgrimage to our beginnings. and. There was a group of sisters that years went by when a whole bunch of us never had that opportunity because we did all our formation in the states and so there's probably about 33 35 of us so i sent out a petition that we go there and that we go during december and january which is probably a crazy time to go to italy but we did because that was the 100th anniversary on december 31st uh, 2000 to 2001 was the 100th anniversary of our founder, Blessed Alberioni, having that inspiration before the Blessed Sacrament to begin the Pauline family, to really to see that need for the world, to take the means of the world and use them for the gospel, basically all the media available to us. So we, a whole bunch of us did a major pilgrimage. We all went and we were there in the Cathedral of Alba on December 31st, so New Year's Eve, 2000. To 2001 and it was great it was packed with paul lines from all over the world it was the most wonderful experience so we had hours of adoration before and then at midnight we had mass and then it would continue on for hours of adoration all through the night well so <laughs> we were there and it was such a profound experience really being in that same cathedral where he received this inspiration but this is when time and eternity come into play you know physically this is New Year's Eve. And in Italy, the, all the property around the churches belongs really to the town, to the city. So they decided to set up a whole New Year's Eve party right on the square in front of the cathedral. So right at midnight, when mass began, the place exploded with music and loud, mm-hmm. mostly American music, which is kind of funny. <laughs> All this American music was playing and it was really loud, like literally. Italians like, love American pop. Yeah, and it was <laughs> like 
the beat was sounding through the walls of the cathedral. And it was like, all I remember is going up to, yeah, exactly. All I can remember is going up to communion and it's like, oh my gosh, La Bamba. And I'm like, okay, body of Christ, amen. <laughs> Trying not to dance in the middle That's of it. That's so Pauline yeah. perfect. But, you know, the and it went on, of course, all night long, you know, just as we were praying. But in it was, distra- it was distracting at first. And you're thinking, how can I pray like this? I can't pray. This music is like blaring in my ears. And then I realized, you know, this is exactly what El Verione talks about, about living Christ and communicating Christ in the world today. We're to live Christ. Here we are before the Blessed Sacrament mm-hmm. and interceding for the world and interceding for the world as we're hearing yeah. what's going on outside. It's as like the world you is know, literally it, at your doorstep. Exactly. Yeah. It was like yeah. perfect in one way. It was a perfect experience because this is exactly who we're called to reach today, the people of a media culture, of a popular media culture. And it, it was just a great experience. I, I'll never, ever forget that. And even though it may have been distracting, it was also deeply profound. And it was the coming together of time and eternity. It was a very incarnational moment for me. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. That really hits on one of my quotes that I kind of plucked out of your book, Father Harrison, that we are given a real and mysterious access to Jesus, whereby we participate in all the events of his life, death and resurrection in our own history. Mm -hmm. And so beautiful. I had a similar experience when I was discerning um, and I was visiting our sisters in Chicago and um, it took a bit of an adjustment. I thought I'd be Carmelite, to be honest. I thought I was like going to go to the cloister and I was really had this romantic idea of like running away from everything, just going straight into Jesus's arms at the foot of the cross. And the Lord called me to be a Pauline. And here I am sitting in a chapel in adoration and there's like, yeah, like every bit of music, bassy beats. And I think even Lollapalooza was happening across the street, <laughs> so, like, like quite literally, like yeah. literally and um and it was a moment of integration for me actually I remember and that's another key thing for me with a sacramental worldview is beauty integration and simplicity where things like come together and reveal you to yourself humanity to you and something about who God is and um I just remember thinking that like you know uh going back to my story before of being in Lourdes I I I don't remember anyone being there. I'm so serious. Like that place is so busy, but I don't remember anyone being there. There's this huge tent that was like right by the river. And um, it was almost completely empty. Like I don't remember anyone being there at all. And now I know that somebody had to be there adoring Jesus. But um, in this tent was Eucharistic adoration. And the host was like three times the size of my head. And there is just, it was huge. And I went into this space and I just sat down and it was so peaceful and quiet. And I just remember it being so white and I was completely captivated. And, um, I didn't even really go in or tour the grounds at all. I got off the train. I went down this roadway across the bridge, found this tent, sat in it, and then left. (laughs) <laughs> and Lord's. and I had like I was completely captivated and that was like at that time in my life it was like I was the world in a sense and the fullness busyness of, of life and all these things that I was thinking about my 10-year plan of life and all this um the Lord captivated me in this silence and then being in Chicago in that um chapel in the middle of the city I was I was realizing and connecting that I had an opportunity to be interceding for humanity from that place Mm -hmm. of silence. And that that turned me into like a tabernacle, you know? Um, And that's like, that gave me such a profound connection with Mary, which you talk about later um, of where that's really, that she's really the climate, right? For all, for uh, Mm -hmm. that, that transformation in Christ. But Mm -hmm. that's so beautiful. I, I love that it's this unfolding that happens sister danielle do you remember when we were at the retreat a retreat house (laughs) i was making a retreat and danielle was there yeah and i at the end of the retreat or there was one point we could talk at a meal and so the other retreat and so we were talking 
and uh, I and you asked me, he's like, your, your daughter is St. Paul. And I said, why, you know of us? <laughs> and she's like, yes, I do. Uh, and then I said, well, why don't you come visit us after, after the retreat's over? And she's like, really? <laughs> do you remember this? <laughs> I and do. I brought you around. I took, so I said, okay, come with, come with us. So I invited you over and you came over and we took a tour of our whole house, our publishing house and everything. And yeah. you're just like, oh, at being an artist that she is yeah. <laughs> my heart was throbbing an amazing artist, amazing. Oh, uh, so yes awesome. amazing artist that she is she is captivated by the art studios and the <laughs> photography studios and like she was going like gaga and i was like yeah uh, it was like sacramental moment right yes. <laughs> yeah it was it really what i find so exciting about this and why i like barely have words to even talk about it because it's like a it's like you want to talk about all the things with it because so many of these experiences of the sacramental worldview I had outside of the church. Yeah. I had as like inclinations towards a real depth of truth and beauty, like in an honest and kind of natural sense, you know, like, and so when I discovered these truths in the church and realized that what I had kind of drifted from was this treasury I was like, I'm done, sign me up. And I think after that day, I talked to Sister Margaret Michael, who was a vocation director, and I was like, so when do I enter? And she was like, <laughs> like uh, she's like, there's just a chill, process. The psyche valve, you know, it's like, know, know. you're like, oh. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Staten Island accent. But I was like, no, I absolutely know this is where I'm supposed to be. This is written on my heart. Like, yeah. I knew this before I had words to know that, like, how to describe it. I know this. I think that's part and parcel with all this too. And, and really it's true. Like suffering is at the, in many ways, is actually at the heart of the Christian life. But God's also, God also wants to delight. And if he gives you particular charisms or gifts in life, they're for a mission. Mm -hmm. And so he wants to give you those things where you're going to delight in them. And, and that, and, and that he wants, like, he wants you to see things and say, like, I desire this. And he goes, yeah, I desire for this for you, too. And, like, to experience that as a gift, like, that that God wants good things for us, too, right? It's not all about suffering and death and, and, and you know, difficulty. It's also about, like, so, yeah, you're seeing the art studio and everything. You're just, like, that is God giving you a gift saying, this desire for art that you have, I want to give you even more of that than you even knew, right? And that moment speaks that to your heart. And that that's part of that sacramentality. That's a, a, that through this particular gift, God is saying, this is how I want to love you, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And he calls you into yourself and yeah. out of yourself at the same yeah. time in that exactly. action as yeah. you participate in Christ. And Sister Nancy, your, your veteran daughter, St. Paul, I'm just like <laughs> still at the entryway being like, wow, this is amazing. But it doesn't come without its sufferings, right? Because it is an entity. I was going to say, how long have you lived in community? <laughs> yeah, no, I know, I know. I Me? discovered that glory. <laughs> <In truth. laughs> no, but, I, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, what I have found um, as an artist and um is that by participating literally like in my gifts in like that that is an offering and that as i use those gifts to glorify god it purifies me too and it's part of the because honestly when i met sister nancy and she invited me and i had actually just recently learned of um of the daughters of saint paul I was terrified in some ways because I had had my well was not, not terrifying no no not of you said, behold, not of behold you. the face of terror <laughs> no, <I> mean, <laughs> you're lovely you were you were the lovely invitation no. <laughs> but um but because I knew that it would mean using my gifts because I knew that um for me I had a conversion experience in college that really was like art became my God, you know, and it was what my world was wrapped around. And um, to pick those back up, you know, was like, that was almost a burden to think that my calling was going to be um, and, and that that was going to be involved in my calling, you know, but it was very clear, like, um, that when I made my vows, um, in the context, it happens in the context of the liturgy. And I really felt like, um, I had put my gifts on the altar when I uh, began to discern with the daughters of St. Paul, well, religious life in general. Um, but really when I um, was 
feeling very called to the daughter of St. Paul. And I just said, Lord, hand them back to me when I can use them for your glory alone. And I thought that I would be like picking them back up. And, but when I was um, make, professing my vows, my first vows, I really felt like the Lord said, like, you're placing yourself on the altar where you have already placed your gifts and together we will make an offering. And like that, that is liturgical for me. That my, my gifts and all of who I am has been placed on the altar. And now I'm going to live a liturgy of life with the Mm -hmm. Lord, you know, and I think it also really hits on another quote that I absolutely love, um, that I'll have on my wall and in my journals. And it's like, without this idea that time and eternity come together in Jesus Christ, the sacramental worldview is an impossibility. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what did it for me is like, I, this is reality. Mm-hmm. This is about stepping into reality, who is Jesus Christ, who is a person who loves you and wants a relationship with you. Amen. Father, I just love the part in when you go more into what is a sacramental worldview, you know, and we, you know, in this perspective of participating and living in Christ, um, how we find um, our wholeness and fullness in Christ. Uh, you, you mentioned this, this aspect of the sacramental worldview recognizes that God always works through creation. God works mm-hmm. through particular times, people, places, things, and situations in our lives. And, you know, to live a sacramental faith, you say, we have a confidence that the physical can make present and point towards the spiritual. I'd love for you to share a little bit more on that. This is always cool, too, because sometimes you forget what you write. <laughs> You're like, oh, yeah, I did write that. Oh. Okay. I know I do that all maybe the time. I, maybe I'm wiser than I thought. No. <laughs> but, yeah, it, it's, it really gets to the crux that this God works through things. God does often actually doesn't work directly. He actually works indirectly because it's a work of cooperation, right? It's an engagement with the freedom of all creation and with our own freedom. He doesn't want to force us. He wants to invite. And so the sacramental worldview, when they were talking about that, it makes present and points towards it. That, that's, I mean, that's what sacrament means, right? Again, like your basic definition is a sacrament is a, is a physical sign that makes present an invisible in, uh, reality so that it makes it present and know, knowable through something in a veiled way, like, you know, bread we use towards the Eucharist, water for baptism, et cetera. But it also points towards something. It, 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 by making it present, actually, it's like a sign that points us towards the true reality mm-hmm. of what it's participating in. Like, so when you're baptized, you are being immersed into the Paschal mystery, right? Mm-hmm. When you are receiving the Eucharist, in, especially in the context of the liturgy, you are participating in Jesus' death and resurrection. It's the renewal of your baptism each and every time. And so, but that even outside of that, like that, and it, these are some of these stories that have been kind of pointing towards this, that God really does use even the normal events of life mm-hmm. to make p- himself present and to point towards him. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and I think most people, most people, sometimes it's, it's, it's more dramatic than others, but I, I've rarely met someone who hasn't, at least who is trying to take faith seriously, hasn't had some sort of moment like that where, because it's also like what it does then is it says that, Creation is ultimately a good thing, right? Which I think gets to a bit of a Pauline thing, right? Towards media and stuff like this, right? Mm -hmm. Like, actually, there's goodness here. Sometimes, yes, it can be used for evil or it can be used for bad things, but it doesn't mean in and of itself it's bad. And that's really, that's, that gets to be very incarnational, right? That, yes, things get twisted and, 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 and used for bad purposes, but it doesn't make the thing itself bad, right? And, and so it's the same thing with media, it's the, and it's the same mm-hmm. thing with creation itself, that God will really use these little means to make himself present and known, but also point us towards him, to, which then builds up, it, it ignites our desire, right? But again, and again, we're going to talk about this next week again. This is this is the barrier for most people, this mm-hmm. idea that God works through things. Can't I just talk God to God directly? Can I just confess my sins to him directly? People don't, a lot of people don't have a problem with the idea of God, but they have a problem with the idea that God works through things. Right. Mm-hmm. And, but what a beautiful dignity he shows to creation that he deigns to involve himself in this. Right. 
Wow. <laughs> like, That's awesome. Yeah. You know, you, what you said, and, and even in your, what you write in your book, too, about the sacramental world with you is about seeing everything through the eyes of eternity mm -hmm. and um, and talking about media, because that's what I write about. So. <laughs> no, um, really? In my, in my <laughs> book, I would not have known. I would A not Sacred known. <laughs> Look, it's Becoming Cultural Mystics, I actually talk about viewing the art and artifacts of the popular media culture through the eyes of faith. Really, basically, mm -hmm. as you said, it's a sacramental worldview, seeing everything through the eyes of eternity. It's a sacramental vision on the popular media culture and the art of the culture. So the movies, the television, um, you know, video games, everything, the music that comes out of the culture, not everything is good, not everything mm -hmm. is perfect, but often because it's human beings creating, there are some elements of truth, of human needs and desires that are coming out of it that can be elements that we can draw on to be able to communicate the fullness of truth, which right. is found in Christ, yeah. right? And everything is in Christ, the fulfiller of all our needs and desires. What you're talking about is like the beauty of the sacramental worldview and what it has to offer people yeah. and like what is lacking in our world is like I hear over and over even the Catholic world Christian world secular world that these are dark times this is darkness this is you know so much evil rampant and though that we need to acknowledge and call out evil where it is the sacramental worldview offers hope amidst darkness it says that this is the most epic story to be told right now that's when saints arise that's when yeah. you know yeah these new epic narratives <laughs> arise out of the darkness like so like there's real beauty to behold even in this moment and i think that that's something yeah. um, that i even discovered in the apathy or the like uh kind of resignation or disillusionment in my own journey um that there was a spark of hope even in the midst of all what i was experiencing and that that was god revealing himself yeah and, and it gets to this idea that when we're doing this creation like yeah people might do but it's still a person at work, right? Mm -hmm. And what the creation and what does creation do? It reveals the creator, right? So even in our own creation, even if like, so then it gives us like a bit of a, a, a more like, like you're, you're saying, Sister Nancy, like this, this kind of like more eternal focus. Mm -hmm. I love this phrase from Pope Benedict, faith, faith is nothing more than sharing in the vision of Jesus, yes. right? Um, and, and that's what we're supposed to do. So then you look at these things, and how would Jesus look at these things? Would he look at them as, oh, you horrible person, I can't believe you're doing this song or this movie or whatever, or I see your desire being revealed in your creation. Yes, it's twisted, and I want to untwist it for you, but I'm going to enter into into all of this and to bring and to kind of just lead you out of that. It speaks to the desire, and it speaks to what's being revealed. And that's 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 the Christian hope here. It's not... So it's not pie in the sky, but it, 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 it looks at it from like the angle of curiosity mm -hmm. and awe and wonder rather than like judgment and 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 only speaking from our own like closed mindset. It's right. saying, no, no, I'm gonna look at this from Jesus's vision. Right. And when you start to look at things from Jesus's vision, like things aren't maybe so bad. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> you see a person there. Right. You don't see their act you, you see their actions, but like they are not their actions. They are something more. Like right? with John Paul's phrase, like you are not the sum of your sins. You are the sum right. of the Father's love for you. Right. Amen. That's that's yeah. the vision we're supposed to have of people. So we see, yeah, songs that are like I remember seeing some stuff last week. Like I was I I listened to a song that I was like, ugh. <laughs> but what's this revealing this person's heart? Yeah, exactly. And exactly. how can I pray for them and reach yeah. to their heart? Yeah. This is leading us right into next week's topic, I think is awesome when we're really looking at also what is um, the cultural ide ideologies that are present and how our sacramental worldview can help us, you know, engage with it and, and confront it and, and look at it. And, and I think it'll be a great um, step right into our next week's podcast. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that, especially because so many people's trying to find hope in this moment or to, to discover the like really authenticate their own journey. They're having, mm -hmm. they're feeling as though they have to step away from the sacraments in order mm -hmm. to do that. And I really like, I'm excited to delve into this next, uh, 
chapter because it's really, there's such an awesome discovery for all of us of authenticating who Mm -hmm. we truly are um, through the sacraments. And so I'm excited to talk about that. So this is like a perfect moment to um, enter into a prayer and kind of interceding, but also asking for that grace ourselves to live Jesus master, our way or truth or in life for our mind, will, and heart that he might truly radiate through us. So I'm going to share a prayer here um, from our book for the queen of apostles prayer book. It's really beautiful. It's like a little treasury of all the, the best prayers um, throughout time. And this one's from blessed James Alberione. Jesus divine master. We adore you with the angels who sang the reasons for your incarnation. Glory to God and peace to all people. We thank you for having called us to share in your saving mission and kindle in us your flame of love for God and for all humanity. Live in us so that we may radiate you through our prayer, suffering, and work, as well as by word, example, and deed. Send good laborers into your harvest. Come, Master and Lord, teach and reign over all. Jesus, Master, our way, our truth, and our life. Teach Teach us your way of truth truth and and holiness. holiness. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, you guys. It was really great to join you on this episode, and I look forward to the next two. Same here. God God bless you all. God bless you. Take care. Thank you so much for listening. This podcast is a fruit of the Daughters Project. This initiative of the Daughters of St. Paul to spread the gospel online is made possible by our generous Patreon supporters. Consider joining us in our mission by contributing to Patreon today. You can find us at thedaughtersproject.com and on social media at Daughter St. Paul. God bless you.